Hello and welcome to the Majlis, Central Asia podcast at Radio Free Europe Radio Liberty. I'm Mohammed Tahir, your host here in Washington, D.C. Muslim majority Central Asia known with its distinct nature of belief system. Though vary from country to country in general, the region has not seen the type of religiously motivated security problem like some of its neighboring countries yet. But things are changing. Over the past few years, hundreds of Central Asians have gone to join radical groups abroad. Several organizations with known ties to Central Asia are engaged in fighting in various countries. These are obviously concerning trends, but in recent days, several reports came out by a number of organizations expressing alarm about alleged radicalism in Central Asia, as if the region was turning to a hot spot of terrorism. On today's Majlis, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty's Central Asia podcast, we will discuss why are Central Asians becoming the focus of such an alarming reports about jihadists. Where does this impression come from and how to separate facts from fictions when it comes to reporting about religion in Central Asia? To discuss the subject, I have David Montgomery, who is the director of SIDAR, which stands for Communities Engaging with Difference in Religion and is author of a book called Practicing Islam, which looks into practice and meaning of the Islamic life in post-Soviet Kyrgyzstan. David, welcome to the Majlis. Thank you. Very nice to have you also joining us. Noah Tucker, associate at the George Washington University Central Asia Program, also associate with our Uzbek service in Prague. Welcome on board, Noah. Thank you. Happy to be here. We also have Edward Lemon, postdoctoral researcher at the Columbia University. Welcome on board, Edward. Oh, thank you. And Bruce Panier, editor of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, Central Asia blog, Kishlak Awazi is joining us. Uh, Bruce, welcome to the Matisse. Thank you. Great to have you. Okay, with this, let's dive into this. The topic of alleged radicalism in Central Asia becomes such an interesting issue these days. I have at least two reports, one published in a Western media, the other authored by the a think tank based in Kazakhstan. Both talks almost in the same language. Some part makes you really scared to death. Obviously, there are also many things in, in these reports which make sense, but in the absence of uh, solid data, the authors and probably we will be playing lots of guest games today, so we are in the disputed territory. We have a lot to learn on the go, uh, so please feel free to amplify, expand, or disagree directly with uh, points other guests are making. Please don't wait for me to prompt your questions so that we have a lively debate today. So I guess uh, most of us read one of these uh, latest stories that have emerged in various uh, publications, and I know all of you have some level of concern uh, when it comes to uh, their content. Let's start with you, Nova. Uh, what is troubling you in these reports? Well, maybe one of the first things we could say that's troubling is it, it struck me as you introduced the program uh, when you talked about um, having seen so many recent reports that describe the area as a new hotbed of radicalization or potentially the next big area to which Islamic radicalism is supposed to spread in the world, it, it struck me that, in fact, you could have introduced a program exactly the same way 10 years ago, 15 years ago, and 20 years ago. Uh -huh. um, and in fact, 25 years ago, if yeah. we, we go back far enough into the 1980s, you know, we can trace people have had this same discussion about Central Asia over and over and over again. And for the most part, it's self-reinforcing. It's based on this idea. It's been repeated so many times that it's taken to be true, uh, sort of in and of itself. And I think it's particularly, I say that, you know, not just because it's ironic or, or just to sound, you know, sort of smarmy, but in fact, in some of the recent journalistic reporting or in editorials that we've seen, these articles specifically link back to the late Soviet period and make these claims that were being made in the 1980s that there was some sort of organ organized renaissance of Islamic militancy in the Soviet Union and in, in the Central Asian parts of the Soviet Union during the Gorbachev years uh, or even before that in the 1970s. And these were claims that were made in the 1980s and are now being treated as fact uh, in the present. But the truth is that these claims were based um, on no evidence at all, really, and, and in subsequent scholarship turned out to just 
simply be a very poor description of what was actually happening on the ground. Right. Anything to add, uh, Edward? I, I would agree with Noah that this is certainly nothing new. I think if we look at particularly the Soviet period, you know, the titles of books like The Islamic Threat to the Soviet State, Moscow's Muslim challenge you know there was this assumption that if there was going to be if the soviet union was going to collapse it would come from the soft underbelly you know it would come from central asia and you know a lot of the western literature on the region at the time called it muslim central asia you know that the fact that it was the population was islamic was particularly important and that from this islamic parallel set of beliefs to communism would come rebellion and revolution and, and islamic militancy perhaps spilling over from Afghanistan, but obviously we haven't seen that happening. I think there are two major problems with a lot of the work that is done on radical Islam in Central Asia. And the first is the assumptions upon which the argument that radical Islam is an existential threat to the region or a major threat to the region is based on. And the first is that poverty and underdevelopment in the region directly contributes to radicalization. And I think the studies that are available by many academics um, and some think tanks indicate that this isn't the case. I mean, I've, in my own research, have looked at the profiles of 215 Tajik citizens who've joined Islamic State. And, you know, what we see is that although some of them are from poor backgrounds, many of them are well educated. You know, 50% of the 215 have at least an undergraduate degree. Many of them are from even quite prominent local families. You know, they're not always, you know, from the poorest groups. Um, so I think that's important. I think, second, you know, this link between religion and radicalization you know this idea that if society islamizes it's automatically going to radicalize i think this is also um, often misplaced and i think here we see a lot of similarities between often what the government is saying and what these western think tanks and uh, some journalists are saying you know that increasing religiosity in society leads down the path as a straight path down to radicalization and that isn't always the case i think from the from the available data that we have and that's you know quite limited you know the indications are that most the vast majority of of the tajik fighters that i've looked at had no formal religious education you know they hadn't spent time in madrasas they had no real knowledge of islam so it seems like most of the factors that are contributing to radicalization are in fact non-religious okay. and then i think that that leads us to the second major problem with a lot of the a lot of the literature is this paucity of data you know there's there's simply not a lot of information about radical islam out there you know from which we can draw a, a measurement of the threat and i think over relying on what is said by officials which was what a lot of the western analysts during the soviet union did what a lot of what a lot of a lot of uh, analysts still do today you know leads us down the path to alarmism i think we need to be very honest about what we can really say about this issue because ultimately we know we know less than we actually know david you've been to uh, central asia researching about this topic for months and then you have these reports coming out from western countries also from the region itself like i'm referring to erlan karin here who is the author of one of these reports uh, kind of raising alarm on this uh, topic so what is your understanding what's happening here first yes your impression of the reports and also the opinions that's expressed involving some level of skepticism on that by our panelists today? Well, I mean, I think uh, both Ed and Noah are, are right in terms of many of the, the readings or reports or, you know, editorials, whether it's um, in the Chicago Tribune, the Washington Post, um, some of the recent uh, reports coming from the crisis, International Crisis Group, um, as well as the one you mentioned, I think there's factual errors in some of them, uh, which both was alluded to both by Noah and Ed. I also think that there's sort of there's a there's a bias and a shorthand for what Islam means. And I was thinking about it because, as Noah said, this is this is the same type of language and rhetoric that took place, you know, 20, 30 years ago, and we see it in other places as well. We saw, for example, there was a very influential book, Balkan Ghost by Robert Kaplan, which had an influence on how the Clinton administration engaged with Bosnia. You know, it was a well-written book, as, but it didn't have a depth of understanding of the Balkan region. And the message that came out of reading the book was that, you know, these populations have never got along. They've always fought each other. And it was an ethnic issue, right? So that it was understood that ethnicity was shorthand, that people couldn't get along. 
Whereas the reality was is that people had lived together. They had gotten along. There, were, there was intermarriage and all of these things. But people kept telling that story. And because it was an ethnic story that we couldn't do anything about because deep down they just wouldn't, wouldn't be able to work it out. We didn't engage. And I think a similar type of thing happens with regards to Islam. There's a sense that somehow there's a continuation of Islam in its worst cases with ISIS, as to other people who might become more orthopraxic or orthodox in their practice, might lead to radicalization that it doesn't actually play out in Central Asia, where you have people who oppose the state, may be doing so for reasons that have nothing to do with religion, and the state may be responding by referring to them as radical Muslims. And the idea that somehow Islam is the descriptive factor for opposition can be misleading because there's often other factors below that that lead people to oppose the state or, or feel disaffected from the state. So that's one, one sort of bias, I think, in a lot of the reporting, that somehow there's a problem with people being too Muslim. Mm -hmm. I think some of this problem also is seen in how Central Asian states engage with it. And you see that in some of the reporting. It's, it's not always an explicit bias or anything that's acknowledged, but there's almost an implicit understanding that if, you know, I think, you know, it, there was a sentence that came out in the recent International Crisis Group report that really struck me, right? And it was talking about in the absence of political pluralism, a reliable state and economic opportunities, a growing number of citizens are taking recourse in religion. And for me, that's a, that's a sentence that makes it seem as if political pluralism, reliable state, and economic opportunities is related to one being religious or not religious. That's problematic, I think, because there may be political pluralism or reliable state or economic opportunities, and people may or may not be religious. They're not necessarily related. But in, in a lot of the reports, there's already this assumption that somehow Islam is, if it becomes too Islamic, too, too active in its practice, it's somehow threatening, and, and the reason for it being that is because of the failures of the state, whereas the failures of the state may or may not have anything to do with religiosity. Let's bring, uh, let's bring Bruce here. Uh, you are welcome if you want to add anything to what has been said. My question would be then why these reports are emerging? Why are Central Asians becoming the focus of these alarming reports about is jihadist Pakistan in this case? Well, I mean, obviously I agree with what all the panelists have said so far about what the, where these misconceptions find their origins. There's no doubt it's it's been mischaracterized characterized for from the start pretty much you know the the reason that i think a lot of the focus has come on the central asians now is because a couple of isolated incidents did feature central asians uh you know the the attack in istanbul on new year's eve uh you have a few others like that 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 aren't happening and they're happening outside central asia and then these people are identified as central asians and and for some reason uh, because most people, let's face it, haven't heard of Central Asia, they start to get the idea that, you know, I've read three stories in the last two years where Central Asians featured. It must mean that uh, this is a hotbed of Islamic extremism or something. You know, it's just, it just poor, in some regards, poor journalism that, that no one has done the background research to find out uh, how much of this is true. I, I mean, you could probably find citizens from you know, dozens of countries uh, who have been involved in terrorist attacks around the world. And if you wanted to focus on that one country, you'd probably find that, that in two or three incidents over the last few years, citizens from such and such country took part in it. It doesn't mean that the whole country or the whole region is given to that kind of uh, sentiment. But uh, unfortunately, um, you know, like I said, we've seen some of these newspaper articles and, and other reports come out and they, you know, I guess just the way they put it, like you said at the very intro, they make it sound so alarming. Uh, like this is something you got to watch out for. You know, I, I won't say which article it was, but there was the one that a recent article and it has a part that says, you know, I'll do this in the radio voice, but there's another part of the world where Islamic state is rising a region. Few Westerners know. And of course that region ended up being central Asia, you know, and, and we know central Asia because we've been out there and that's why I know this is not true. Uh, but, you know, this kind of stuff, if this is all you know about it, you know, it just kind of perpetuates the reporting. One person reads this and then they'll write up their own article and this is the kind of stuff that will feature in it. 
That's interesting, Bruce. Um, it seems that we are all in agreement today. Um, let me play a little bit rule of bad cop here. What I mean is perhaps some of these reports might be taking its sources from the incidents, Bruce, that you alluded uh, to. Uh, here I'm not talking about Uzbekistan or Tajikistan, but countries like Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan never had uh, an issue with uh, radicalism. But these days, things are happening. And even if you don't believe to local reports, look at their numbers in Syria, for instance. You never had a Kazakh radical fighting among a terrorist group, but now you have them. And you also, Bruce, mentioned a number of explosions happened in the region and also outside of the region. For example, in Kyrgyzstan, like there was some issue with the in front of the Chinese embassy, uh, for instance, last year, and then few explosions in Kazakhstan. And then outside, for instance, like in the Istanbul nightclub uh, shooting, we find out that one of them at least was a citizen for Uzbekistan. And then this Istanbul airport bombing last year again, a Kyrgyzstani and Uzbekistani citizens were, according to Turkish media, Turkish authorities were involved in that. So how to explain these incidents? Uh, who wants to take the question? Well, if I could just jump one second and, and refer to one thing about the internal stuff. Certainly, and Yerlan Karan refers to attacks in, in Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan in his, in his report and groups that are there. Uh, and he identifies Jaish al-Mahdi in Kyrgyzstan in 2010. And later he talks about Jundal Khalifa in Kazakhstan, which came out in 2011. Now, in the case of both these groups, it was never clear that there really was anybody in these groups, except for a few people. Once they were broken up, they never reappeared again. Uh, it just looked like a bunch of 13, 14 guys that got together and decided this was going to be the name of their group. They got a lot of publicity. They still are getting publicity, obviously. But there was never any proof that they were really part of any organized a group or that they were even linked to any organized known extremist or terrorist group but and yet still their names appear I understand, uh, Bruce, that. But even that wasn't the case in the past, isn't it? I'm just trying to say, you know, some of these uh, phenomena uh, or some of these incidents weren't happening in the past. So how to make sense of this in the light of these language? All right, well, I'll throw up one comment and then we got to give it to the other panelists. Yeah, um, sure. You know, as far as the people that moved from Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan to uh, to areas where it's Syria, Iraq, to join the Islamic State group, whichever, I'd be real curious to see the data that's produced like a year from now on outward migration. When those people left, when those families were leaving, the Islamic State was on the offensive, and their publicity pretty much across internationally said they were winning. And, and of course, we know that they had their own filtered advertising, which was portraying themselves as some kind of uh, Islamic utopia that they were building. And those were the days when we saw reports of families leaving from Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan. I haven't seen too many of those reports, uh, any really, in the last three or four months. Yeah. And I expect that uh, any, any desire to go and join a group right now that's, that's apparently losing, uh, you know, uh, is not there, simply. It was when they were winning and they made it look like it was a great deal, the people would go. Uh, now that they're obviously losing, I, like I said, I just don't see the out-migration to these places anymore. Yeah. Noah, Edward, David, please jump in. Yeah, I'd be happy to respond to this one. Um, I'll, I'll try to be quick and, and give others a chance to. I, I think it is important. Um, uh, you know, I know, as you mentioned, you're playing devil's advocate a little bit, but... You know, we cannot, uh, when we say that, you know, the, the analysis that's done in many of these reports is wrong or it's faulty or it's, it's, it's giving the wrong explanations, this is, of course, not to deny that there is a problem um, with violence of some kind or, or not to deny that young Central Asian men have been found uh, participating in violent militant groups in different parts of the world. In fact, you know, the thing is, the, the, the issue here is in the analysis. This is to say that um, I would suggest that rather than one of the one of the more productive ways of looking at this is rather than rather than seeking some sort of grand explanatory theory that's rooted in Soviet history and all of this stuff is look at the cases themselves and see where the evidence takes us. And we have to acknowledge also that the problem is larger than any one of these single conflicts. Uh, so, And the evidence that we see once we look at the larger problem suggests that there's something else going on here beyond Islam or poverty or anything else. 
else in, in, in addition to how problematic those are as explanatory factors anyway. And I'll give you one, one quick example because we're speaking in broad generalities here. So uh, if, you go, <laughs> if you go outside of the Syrian conflict, which is, which is beginning to wane now in a way as, as each of these groups has suffered serious military defeats, if you go to the Syrian, uh, from the Syrian conflict and change your focus up uh, to Ukraine, and uh, an area where uh, a conflict is continuing um, to, we'll say, simmer, I guess, and, and occasionally break out again into very intense violence. One of the things that you'll find, perhaps surprisingly there, is um, Central Asians and Chechens um, there as well. And in some cases, you'll find them even fighting on opposite sides. Uh, I just I just spoke this morning one of uh, RFE with one of current times great reporters uh, Shakira Tulaganova, who's herself an Uzbek who was doing field reporting uh, in Donetsk last year and was standing in the airport as they were doing a, a piece on that and noticed that there was a young Uzbek. Um, there with the pro-Russian militia groups. And she came over, she introduced herself, she was very surprised to find an Uzbek uh, guy there. He, she struck up a conversation with him, and he told his story. He was an Uzbek from northern Tajikistan, and he said, actually, that every, in, in his words, most of the young men from his village had gone to fight in different theaters, but most of them had gone to fight ice for ISIS. And he said, uh, this young man who's fighting on behalf of Russia, so who's, who's in a, on, on the pro-Russia uh, Ukrainian separatist forces, uh, so he, he's, and these are, are groups that use overtly Christian iconography and fight sometimes as militant Christian Orthodox groups. This guy said he, his first choice was to join ISIS. But the reason that he ended up fighting, <laughs> fighting for the for the Ukrainian separatists is that he didn't have a foreign passport, so he wasn't able to travel uh, to go to Syria. But he could travel within the former Soviet Union on his Tajik domestic passport. He basically just wanted to fight somewhere. He had nothing else to do uh, in his village. Everybody else was gone. There were no employment opportunities, and he thought that becoming a soldier of fortune uh, was a good career choice for him. And and he was, in a sense, agnostic about what side he fought on. You know, it wasn't even about the propaganda of one side or the other. He was a young guy who just wanted to go out somewhere, make some money, have an adventure, and fight. And he was just as willing to fight for an overtly orthodox Christian militant group as he was to fight for ISIS. Interesting, interesting. This is David. Yes. I, I also think that oh, I just wanted to sort of it's not that we deny that these things are happening. I think that you know everyone has sort of suggested that we are concerned about how things get reported and and then how that's interpreted by people who know very little about the region. Uh, I was looking at one of the, at the Tribune uh, editorial, and there's this amazing couple sentences where it talks about sort of the repression of Muslim radicalization that continued after the 1991 collapse. And then he goes on saying one of the one of Asia's most dangerous terrorist groups, the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan, has in the past allied itself with Al Qaeda and fought alongside Taliban fighters against American troops in Afghanistan. Today, it pledges allegiance to the Islamic State. Now, if I know nothing about the region, I make all sorts of assumptions about the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan taking over the region. It's really just probably somehow similar or if not the same as the Taliban. And, and yet that doesn't play out in reality. But the, the message that takes that, that I walk away with not knowing anything or having a context or depth of understanding about the region is that, wow, things are really bad. And they're only going to get worse. And probably the only thing that makes sense to me to explain that is Islam, right? Oh, it's radical. It's radical Islam. And there's something inherent in radical Islam that's causing this. Uh, uh, and I think the problem is this causal assumption that Islam is the driving factor. Uh, uh, and as as both, you know, as, as all of the uh, uh, Bruce and and Ed and Noah have have made clear that there's these other factors that probably play a more significant role than Islam in explaining why there's opposition and explaining these type, these other incidences that take place. And um, and I think we just need to be a bit more critical about right, that. Right. 
uh, Edward, uh, these are new uh, phenomena that we are talking about, either the way this trend being explained by the authorities locally and also the way it's being reported outside of the region. The other fact is the guys that we are talking about today who uh, found involved in these isolated incidents, these are the guys not belonging to this old ideologue of IMU or Hizbut Tahrir. These are some new guys, new kids, whatever the motivations are. Obviously, something is changing. Isn't the case, uh, Edward? I would say that the the reasons for joining these groups, I guess, as as the other panelists have alluded to, you know, I I think there are many similarities with, you know, the reason you would have joined up with a militia in uh, during the Tajik civil war, for example, you know, it's about masculine pride. It's about often about local connections. And, you know, if we kind of examine the cases that we have evidence for, you know, where whole villages or, or large numbers of individuals from villages in northern Tajikistan have gone to fight in Syria, you know, these kind of fictive or real kin ties continue to matter. And I think, you know, I, I don't think uh, a tremendous amount has changed. I, I think, you know, the Syrian conflict has offered an opportunity, a theatre, a kind of a mechanism for some of these individuals who do want to to fight. And as, as Noah said with this story, very interestingly, you know, often it, it's not a matter of where they're fighting or who they're fighting. You know, it's just the process of fighting uh, and seeking an adventure that, that, that appears to be most important for these uh, individuals rather than any kind of religious commitment to the to to jihad you know this you know the syrian conflict has offered an increased opportunity for 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 individuals from the region to uh, to to go and fight and I, I don't think a tremendous amount has changed you know for example there was talk that the economic crisis in russia in 2014 2015 would lead to a kind of mass exodus to syria and iraq and that that obviously hasn't been the case and i think as bruce said rather than you know, seeing a rise of, cent- of ISIS in Central Asia, as, as the Chicago Tribune article tried to argue. You know, in fact, we're seeing, you know, a, a, a rapid fall in, in the number of Central Asians going to Syria and Iraq. Great. So I guess we all are in agreement uh, that the nature of traditional or nomadic form of belief system, which Central Asia was known for, is somewhat changing, but not the way it's being reported outside, like if the region was turning to such a hot spot. But what direction this comeback to religion is taking and what are the triggering points in this transformation? We will continue our discussion talking about this and many other questions shortly. Hey everyone, before we get into the second part of the show, just a quick reminder that if you really like Majli's podcast, there's a real chance that you will also like my other radio show that's called Gandhara Podcast. The show discusses latest developments in Pakistan and Afghanistan from local perspective. And the podcast is published in every second week on Radio Free Europe Radio Liberty's Gandhara website. It's a totally must-follow discussion for foreign policy nerds with interest in the region. First, let me recap the debate uh, that uh, today on the Majlis, we are discussing recent hype among media outlets about alleged rise in radicalism in Central Asia and its possible reasons, facts, and fictions, etc. Discussing the subject with me are David Montgomery, author of uh, Practicing Islam, a book uh, which looks into practice and meaning of Islamic life in Kyrgyzstan, Noah Toker, associate at the George Washington University's Central Asia program, Edward Lemon, postdoctoral researcher at the Columbia University in Bruce Pony, editor of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, Central Asia, Blog, Kishlak, Owasi. I'm Mohammed Tahir here in Washington, D.C. Welcome back, gentlemen. So this is a common belief, I believe, that uh, in the panel or to the experts that you talk to, that there are exaggeration about level of radicalism, threat, etc. But I guess many people also agree that level of religious has been growing since the collapse of the Soviet Union. So what are the signs that it is happening, uh, David? The sign that there's greater religiosity? Is yeah. that the question? Yeah. I mean, I think that uh, there's sort of two things, and, and one perhaps helps explain the way in which we've struggled with how Islam is portrayed in in the media is, you know, Central Asia came out as a pretty secular place. Yeah. Islam was largely privatized. It wasn't something that was seen or expected to have any uh, active public role. It was to be largely you know, a cultural, this is after, this is during the Soviet Union and after the Soviet Union, it's supposed to be largely, largely cultural. And, and part of that has to do with, I think, the, the leadership 
throughout the region were people who were largely secular. And the secular state is, is worried a bit about religion. And in some ways, it sees the need to be protected from religion. You know, on the other hand, many people who have been trying to make sense of, you know, their, their challenges in the world, both existential, but also physical challenges, whether it's making ends meet, employment or whatever, are always looking for ways of making sense of meaning and in, in, in their communities. And, and you have people who are finding religion as, you know, Islam especially, but other, uh, other forms of Christian practice they're finding religion as, as something that helps explain the types of struggles. They're, they're engaging with it at different levels. It's incredibly complicated and diverse. And to say that someone is Muslim is hard to understand what that means because it doesn't mean one thing. It means many things to different people at different times. And I think that you know one story that I think is, becomes really important in terms of understanding it is the Tablighi Jamaat movement. Because you have a group of people who have become more orthodox and more orthopraxic in their practice, and they go around to different villages and they'll pray in in mosque with people who they probably would not have known before. And they maybe go for, for three days, they go for a week, they go for 40 days, whatever, but they're always moving around. Now, this scares a state that's uncertain what Islam might mean. My guess is it scares it not because of the substance of what's being preached so much as the fact that you have different connected groups than you've ever had before. There's a deeper connection. Now these groups know not necessarily only the people in their community, but they know people in other communities, and they can mobilize more quickly. And this is terrifying to a state that's concerned about opposition. Uh, obviously, we are not anymore talking about the fighting guns and Central Asians being radicalized, whatever, but the simple, fact, the simple fact that the people are returning to their religious ideologies at, at some level. You have seen, like, number of mosques being opened, number of churches probably being established over the past several years, and you have seen the young girls, some of them, wearing hijabs, which wasn't the case. So we are just uh, discussing to understand the background of this in a way that how people are returning, what are the signs that people are returning to religion. So anyone, Edward, uh, Neva, Bruce, uh, Kloris, are you uh, jumping? Uh, yes, well, you know, I mean, I was there when they were starting out. Certainly in 1992, when I actually got to travel around a lot, there weren't hardly any mosques in the place at all. Right. Uh, it was actually part of my my sociological survey, one of the questions was, which building would you like to see appear in your village? And the unanimous answer over the course of 21 months was a mosque. If you travel Central Asia now, uh, the mosques are, are everywhere. And of course, you know, the former atheist leaders of these countries are now competing to have the biggest and, and fanciest mosque in their capitals. Uh, so it's, the signs are there all over the place. I think I think one of the big problems they had in the early 1990s that they paid for later was that um, first because they wanted to they wanted something to clearly divide them from from their former Soviet past and from Russia and Moscow the Kremlin in particular they, they invited all kinds of different Muslim groups to send people when I was there in 90 certainly in 1992 I used to run into Saudis and Pakistanis all the time uh, and they were there as missionaries for various sects of Islam. And it took the governments in the region a while to figure out that, that not all of those sects were probably somebody that they wanted in their country. Uh, and then you started, they started weeding out some, choose, picking and choosing which ones were kind of acceptable and which ones were less acceptable to the point where now they're, they're, none of those groups really are acceptable. The state's developed its own form of Islam in the meantime. But, but certainly the people from the very start wanted gravitated toward the religion. They wanted to know more about it. Um, and they never forgot the ties weren't broken during the Soviet Union. They were thinned. But this was one of the things that they really wanted. And uh, so I was, I was hardly surprised at all when I see the, the way people have re-embraced Islam in the region today. Right. Nova, Edward, feel free to, to jump in. Though there are some distinct tribes, but historically Central Asia is made up by multicultural, multi-ethnic societies. So does this evolution of belief has been taking place equally in all religions, or we are talking only about Islam? 
I don't know. I mean, it's it's so problematic to figure out what sort of word to pick for this. And this is something that, you know, among scholars, uh, you know, sociologists and anthropologists in particular, you know, we've we've spent a, a lot of the last uh, 15 years or so trying to figure out what exactly to call this and, and how to describe it. I mean, it is even, it's problematic to talk of it as a return, although lots of people describe it that way themselves. Um, but, you know, you can't go back in time. You're not turning back the clock to something else. In fact, you're moving on to something new. Uh, if you're doing something that you didn't do before, and you didn't do that before in your life, but you perceive that your ancestors did, you're not going back to the same thing uh, that they did. You are, you're doing something new for yourself. You're, you're opening up a, a new territory. And we see what we see, in fact, in Central Asia is that people have done all sorts of things. Uh, there is no uniformity in this sort of return, quote, to Islam. Um, there are all kinds of people who have found many different ways uh, to describe their lives as, uh, as religious or, or to, to factor religious beliefs into their lives. Uh, and many of them have nothing to do with what we would in the West West talk about um, as Islam or, or what what groups that we don't like, you know, like the like these um, violent Islamist groups like Al Qaeda or ISIS, anything that they would describe as Islam themselves. Um, I mean, if if you are David can speak better to this because he's he's done great field work on this specifically. But one of the things that I always enjoy about Kyrgyzstan is that if you ask someone in Kyrgyzstan how they imagine sort of the, the religious landscape around them or how they practice their, their religious life, they talk about this landscape where the entire country, the natural features of the country allow, around them is alive with religious meaning. Um, that you will go to, you'll climb this mountain or go to this lake, go to this specific place uh, because it, it has a religious meaning for them um, that often they connect to, to hundreds and hundreds of years of tradition, uh, whether or not that's literally true or not that's that's the way that they understand it and in many cases these are you know like geologic formations mountains and and rivers and and lakes that have been there longer than human settlement and that have a deep religious meaning to people so the idea of what it means to return to islam means something very different uh, in different places and we see we see a return to, uh, or I don't know if we would even call it a return, I guess a, we see an embrace of religious values and religious communities across a spectrum of religions as well. It's not just, uh, it's not just Islam. Edward, you've been quiet today. Uh, anything to add into this discussion? I mean, what I was referring to is like Noah explained that very nicely. Uh, saying embarrassing their religion or their belief uh, system. So what kind of science are you seeing? And also, is these science equally applied to all the people with religious backgrounds, whatever they are, Christian, Judaism, or Islam, or, or you are seeing this uh, only in Islamic societies? Well, I think, you know, in places like Tajikistan, it is easiest, obviously, to express your Islamic faith. But in Dushanbe, I knew a number of Christians who certainly converts to Christianity mm. rather than ethnic Russians or, or Ukrainians. Uh, these were ethnic Tajiks who'd converted to Christianity. And, you know, they would go to their Bible study groups and they would obviously, you know, they uh, were fervent believers in the faith. But obviously they couldn't express that to their friends. They couldn't even express it to members of their family because of the fear that they would be stigmatized or or, or disowned. Mm. Um, so I think, I think, you know, in, in a place like Tajikistan, you know, certain religious groups maybe operate under or all religious groups operate under uh, operate under some level of uh, some dialectic against the state uh, the secular state but you know non-islamic groups um, non-traditional religious groups in general you know operate under 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 even more pressure and i think it's very difficult for them to express their piety publicly um, and the same goes even for certain individuals you know who are too islamic or you know as as as, as david was saying earlier people who are who are wearing beards, people who are women who are even wearing the hijab in, in, in a place like Tajikistan, uh, do face, at least 
depending on the kind of community they live in, you know, are certainly open to facing uh, certain pressures from the state, pressures from uh, other members of the community. So I think it, it really, you know, I think there's a, revi- a revival or I guess as mm. Noah said, an embrace of religion. But there's certainly, you know, limits on the, the way in which people can show uh, parallel forms of forms of religion, I guess. Mm-hmm. So what is I want to I want to add one thing, if I can, yeah. or, or maybe two, just to sort of disaggregate it a bit. So, uh, you know, it's what we're talking about in terms of people being more expressive of their religion, I, I think is it's important to distinguish that I don't think that has a lot to do with the first part of our discussion about the reporting in the sense that, I mean, clearly people do shorthand. They say, okay, well, there's an issue with these Islamic groups. And now we see people who seem to be more religious, that there's somehow some relationship between those two. And I don't think there is. I think that you have people who are, who are becoming religious and one becomes religious within one's lifetime. So it's, you know, they may connect it back to, you know, it has always been this way. It's our tradition, and, and we learned this from our ancestors. We're returning to that. Or it may be looking external that we want to have sort of a more rigorous moral frame of understanding our life, and we look to whether it's the Muslims we've met in, in Saudi Arabia and in Turkey and in India and in Pakistan or whatever. But I think under, one way to understand religion that I think is productive is as a, a moral framework for getting through life. Now, there's many. It doesn't have to be religion. Communism was one one sort of moral framework that allowed people to understand how to get by in the world. But religion gives a ideology that goes from birth to death and how to deal with all of those things. But that in and of itself, this sort of individual struggle that people are trying to make sense of, right, um, in very real terms that are that are local, that are, are connected to their families, they're connected to their neighbors, connected to the state and, and the broader world in which they're living. They're trying to make sense of these things. That is not, it's not a straight line to get from there to, you know, a sentence that the Islamic movement of Uzbekistan is connected to all of these other groups and that somehow because you have one person in a village who becomes more religious in their practice, that there's a connection. Um, so I just want to sort of make sure that we 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 separate these things Obviously. because a lot of times when we talk about the increased expression of religious practice, we get easily seduced to thinking that this indicates that somehow there's greater support for ISIS or for other groups, and it is because people have become more religiously practiced. They've practiced more religion more often. Right. And right. that the secular state is actually justified in cracking down on these populations. Hmm. Obviously, very interesting discussion. Unfortunately, we have to end uh, the debate. Uh, but let's end that debate with something that uh, we were talking earlier about these reports, some exaggerations on Western media. Whatever is happening in terms of revival of religion, that's a separate story. But the other part is that some people go out of their way and join these groups the problem that leads to some people go to Syria, some people go to join fighting in Ukraine, for instance, whatever purpose they are. Authorities are also failing to address that. So what to do about that specific issue going forward that it is not really becomes a big issue in the region? I would say um, so related to, to tie everything together. Um, and it's not to say that this is a, a causal factor for people to become more religious or any of these things. But I, I think one of the things that we we often neglect um, or in this discussion often gets neglected is that the people, especially in the peripheral parts of the former Soviet Union, these were peripheral states to the Union, and within each of these states there have there are peripheral parts, uh, like southern Kyrgyzstan, for example, which is cut off even from the rest of Kyrgyzstan. And this is the area where we see most uh, militant recruitment and ethnic conflict and other social problems. And I think we can't overlook the fact that one of the the primary experiences of the last 20 years for people there, you know, from from the fieldwork interviews that I've done and living there for a time myself, is this sense of just a 
profound collapse of social order since the fall of the Soviet Union. It's not so much, I think, that people look for an ideology all the time to tell them how to live their lives or that sort of thing. We do. You know, we need a, a moral system uh, that tells us how to navigate our lives. But we used to talk about there being this sort of ideological vacuum that would bring people into religion. I, I think what I see in people or what I what I hear them tell me is that they've seen their social order completely collapse to the point where you don't know which side of the street people are going to drive their cars down. You know, there are, if you are rich enough, uh, you can drive the wrong way down a one-way street as fast as you want, and the police will do nothing about it. And you can get into car accidents and kill people, uh, and the police will do nothing about it. You know, this is a, in Tajikistan, this is something that happens over and over again, where the son or daughter of a rich official will be driving drunk or, or on drugs, driving in a very heavy SUV, run down pedestrians and there are no consequences for them. And this is the kind of collapse of social order um, that many people have experienced. And I think that addressing those problems um, will help address many of the other problems, you know, and, and, and good, there are many good religious associations that, that people turn to um, in order to try to fill those gaps in a positive way. And it's really important that we differentiate between positive associations and negative associations. You know, if the people are, are, are joining together to fund a water pipe uh, or a sewer line to their village, then we shouldn't care whether they do that in the name of an Islamic organization or a Christian organization or an organization of people who are left-handed. Uh, but on the other hand, if they're creating an organization to take up arms and overthrow their government, then we should care about that. Again, whether they're doing it in the name of Islam or whether they're doing it in the name of people who are left-handed. Right, right. Okay. Similar question to you, Bruce or Edward, David, uh, whoever wants to jump in. So whatever the causes are, either driven by any sort of belief system or economic issues, the fact that some people went abroad to join groups, incidents took place locally, and current strategies of the authorities are failing to address this. Uh, so what to do now? Yeah, I think I agree that um, the, yeah, the current strategies um, are in many ways dysfunctional. I, I think the, the kind of major thing is that, you know, there, there have been a few thousand people from the region who've gone to Syria and Iraq, but government kind of assertively secular government policies that kind of securitize any form of religion that doesn't fall outside of the very narrow confines of kind of state approved practices. The grouping together of groups like the Islamic Renaissance Party in Tajikistan with Tablighi Jamawat, Hizbut Tahrir and Islamic State, all of which, you know, have some kind of link to Islam, but all of which are obviously very different organizations. You know, this kind of broad brush policy, you know, has affected tens of thousands of people in the region. And I think, you know, regardless of, of, of whether these policies have any effect on countering radicalization. They certainly have a, a major impact on the lives of, of these individuals and, and their ability to practice religion freely and their ability to openly explore their religiosity. And, and as Noah said, you know, their ability to kind of mobilize as communities to solve the problems, you know, that the state is, is simply not there to, to resolve. And I think, you know, that's the, uh, the great tragedy. I guess, of, of, of kind of these heavy handed counter radicalization policies in the region. And this is, uh, you know, potentially detrimental to the kind of social development of, of, of Central Asian republics in the long term. Briefly, uh, David and Bruce. I think that that also gets to why we're so concerned about the reporting of and the accuracy of reporting on Islam and, and, and the region is is because a lot of the issues, a lot of the problems really are more complex. And you you have to be responsible in presenting that picture because if you if you purely accept the narrative of the state without questioning it, it becomes pretty simple, right? It's just the problem is somehow with Islam. It has something to do with people be radicalizing. And so we crack down and we do that. Whereas I think, you know, Noah and, and Ed both articulated well that the issues probably are, are less around that, right? There's things within people's villages, within their cities that can be addressed that have, you know, nothing to do with one's religious practice, but, you know, the challenge that they see, whether it's, you know, 
the state itself or how the state is not responding in the way that gives them a sense of well-being and contentedness, that those can be addressed. And I think it would go very far to um, addressing a lot of the issues that people are really concerned about. Bruce, shortly. Central Asia is the territory of Islam. I mean, there's other religions focusing, uh, functioning there, but, but historically this is an area of Islam. It's incumbent upon the governments of the region to, to have a greater understanding of Islam. And I'm not saying that they have to turn their countries into to an Islamic state, but the leadership has to understand exactly what the religion is all about, school themselves a little bit in it. They attempt to demonize it for their own purposes all the time when it, when it suits their purposes. And this is unhelpful because it is the religion of the region and it's going to be. And the example I would offer of that is the, these attacks in Kazakhstan last year where the government has been very quick to blame this on religious extremism, the stuff that happened in October, the, the shooting in, in Almaty, when in fact there's there's no link at all, and I think there's no clearer proof that there's no link than the fact that, that uh, supposedly uh, these were inspired by Islamic extremists, but no Islamic extremist group ever took credit for these attacks at all. Uh, so it's counterproductive to, to tell your population who are Muslims that the threat is the, is the nasty Islamic extremist that... that you can't define, but is there somewhere or another. They need to lighten up a little bit on that and get a better understanding of what the religion, what it offers that's positive to its population. Thank you, Bruce Hanier, editor of Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty, Central Asia blog, Gishlak Owazi, for insightful comments and thoughts. Uh, David Montgomery, author of Practicing Islam, a book uh, which looks into practice and meaning of Islamic life in Kyrgyzstan. Nova Tokar, associate at the George Washington University Central Asia program and also associate with Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty's Uzbek service. Edward Lehman, postdoctoral researcher at the Columbia University. Thank you, gentlemen, very much for your time and thoughts today. Thank, Thank you. you. And this is it from me, Mohamed Tahir, host of the Majlis, Radio for Europe, Radio Liberty, Central Asia podcast. Until next week, bye-bye.